Hi, my name is Simon Powers, and this is a lesson on the prelude from the Suite in D minor by Robert de Vizet. This lesson goes along with the repertoire workbook on the same piece, which is available at classicalguitarcorner.com. I have a series of these repertoire workbooks and they've been very popular because what I do is I take a lesson, I've taught these pieces many, many times, and I take these lessons and I've created digital workbooks where I take you through step by step in a structured way through the piece. So we look at techniques associated with the piece. In this case, we have mordants and the trill. We have a, a harmonic analysis. We have a structural analysis. I talk about the scales and the harmony involved. I also talk about phrasing and voicing. So it's a really structured way to approach learning a piece. And in essence, it's like taking a very structured <laughs> lesson with me here in New York City. So let's dive in. This is a wonderful piece. It's only 10 measures long, but within that 10 measures, we have a very finely crafted polyphonic piece. It's a prelude. It starts at the beginning of a suite and it's improvisatorial in style, if I said that correctly. <laughs> it's like you're improvising. What we're going to discover in, in this piece is there are small little ideas that link into larger phrases and then we start to get a sense of structure throughout the piece and it makes coherent sense. These ideas are held within voices. Now voices on the classical guitar, for me anyway, was one of the reasons I initially was attracted to the instrument. It's that effect of you see someone playing and it sounds like there's more than one instrument there. It sounds like there's two guitars playing. And in this piece, you know, Robert de Vizet was actually the court guitarist, the oboist, singer, violist, not viola, viol, the, the, like the cello da gamba, for Louis XIV and Louis XV in the French courts. And in this time, vocal music was very, very important. And I think this piece is very vocal in style. So I like to think about these parts as singers. So let's see where the soprano enters. Well, that's quite clear. It's right here at the beginning. So I'm going to play for you that little soprano line at the beginning. You'll notice, and this is really important, at the very beginning, there's, oops, there's a rest here. That rest offsets that musical line and it propels the musical line towards larger beats. This happens a lot, for instance, in the music of Bach, the famous G minor, um, or I played in A minor, the fugue by Bach. One and two and three and a. That, when people start off the beat, and Bach uses that technique a lot, it propels uh, the music forward, gives it momentum. And here it is no different. We have that larger phrase there, but I can divide it up again into two smaller ones. So let me play that top line, that soprano line, in two short little ideas. There's one. Two short little ideas. Played together. A really important thing to know about this phrasing and this voicing is that we're so tempted on the guitar to play beats, two, three, four. But if you look at that phrasing, I'll get rid of that, making it a mess. If you look at that phrasing I just discussed, we really aren't being asked to accent these beats at all. In that case, two and four. We're actually aiming towards these notes. So we want to bring out the voice. So that, that initial entry voice might be a bit stronger and then we aim towards that E. That gives it that forward momentum and it really sounds like someone singing the line. Excuse my terrible singing. <laughs> now if we keep going with that melodic line, we see again, we start from that, um, that note off the beat. It's not on the first beat, it's starting on the first off beat. And we keep going. aim towards that C sharp. So really what we have is two short phrases, one, two, and then one longer phrase towards that C sharp. <laughs> Sorry for the mess I'm making on this score. If I play it all in a line, it really starts to sound like a very carved out vocal line that someone might sing. Let me just take away some of these things, clean it up. Now, what I would also recommend to enhance that vocal-like quality is when you sing, when we sing, we need to breathe. On the guitar, we don't need to breathe. We have the fingers doing all the movements for us, but we still need to put the breathing into the music. So you could have a breath there, 
uh, you could have a breath there. That would sound like this. And if I made it a little more subtle, not as obvious. It really starts to sound very organic and flowing. And it sounds like a singer. Now let's start bringing in the second voice. And now that we've decided where that phrasing is, uh, it, it's going to help us guide that second voice and it's not going to be so beaty like this. Which would be very tempting on the guitar to accent the beats. But now we know we're being guided by that phrasing, so it might sound more like this. And then it has a bit more shape to it, a bit more life to it. Now, that second voice here, this lower voice, let's call it, for the lack of a better term, let's call it the bass voice, starts there on the D. And we actually overlap the two voices. So the soprano voice is finishing there on the, what is it, an F? And uh, the bass voice comes in on a D. So that's actually called an elision, where two things allied. The one thing ends and one thing begins. And it's important to bring out the separation of that voice, so I like to play that bottom D uh, with a thumb. So what I've done in the repertoire workbook is I've actually gone through the entire piece and exploded the voices onto three different sta staffs, staves. <laughs> and uh, that way you can actually play through the individual voices all the way through, and you can see definitively where all those voices are. There's in fact a third voice that does come in, like here. Uh, where, and also there's a bit of a conversational quality that happens down here with these voices. They start talking to each other, it's like in a sequence. <laughs> can hear that that sequential idea is actually just taken from the opening material. Very closely related. Uh, so if you want to have a more in-depth look at the phrasing and the voices there in that piece, you can have a look on the first, uh, page two and page three is voicing and phrasing, and I go through the entire piece there. Let's move on now to some technical issues. One of the first technical issues I do want to bring up, and it's not mentioned in the repertoire workbook, is about the barres that you're going to find in this piece. There's one there, there's one there, there's quite a few of them. Now, just a little point, but an important one nonetheless, is that when you are creating these barres, just make sure you're not using more effort than you need to. This happens a lot in our playing if we're not careful. So for instance, here at measure three, uh, just make sure you're holding down three strings here as opposed to four or five. Um, in uh, here, in measure seven, you only need to hold down two strings with your barre. Here on the first string, oh, sorry, first fret. And you want to be sure that you're not holding them down more than that because at the first fret, it's rather difficult to hold down uh, your barre, so you're going to cause stress and tension and you're wasting energy. So just go through the piece uh, and make sure that you're not expending any more energy than you need to. Secondly, another point that we don't go through in the repertoire workbook because it really is something I deal with in the technique and musicianship courses on the site is the idea of right hand balance. And uh, that entails being able to separate those voices Oops. What I suggest doing in this piece is taking one voice at a time and trying to bring it out, make it more prominent than the other, especially if you have two voices playing at the same time. So that passage, maybe you'll bring out the bass, or maybe you'll bring out the top voice. This has more to do with your oral understanding of the music than any technical prowess. It is obviously you need to be able to weight one finger strongly, uh, more strong than the other, but it is actually more that you know what voice you're trying to bring out. So I would go through the sections and experiment with bringing out the top voice, the bottom voice, or even the middle voice. That's a challenge. That's a challenge and a half. <laughs> so now let's move on to some, some of the techniques I go through in the repertoire workbook. We start with scales because scales are a great way to explore the piece. This piece is in the key of D minor. 
And if you've ever wondered why we have melodic minors and they change fingering going up as opposed to coming down, here is a good piece to show you. Melodic minors exist because they offer a smooth voice leading up towards the tonic, in this case the D in D minor, uh, without having that awkward jump that occurs in the harmonic minor, because we do need the C sharp, the raised seventh. So in the melodic minor we get this, raised six degree, six degrees, so B natural, C sharp, up to D. So it gives you a stepwise movement up to that C sharp. If we were playing harmonic minor it would sound like this. It's quite a leap. And the reason vocal writers don't use this very often is because vocally it's quite a jump and it's a bit uh, jarring. On the way down we have a similar stepwise motion and this time we're using C natural and back to B flat. So we're back in the key signature. Now if you want to see some examples of that, we've got this descending line here in the bass where we get C natural. We do have a chromatic line here. There's the B flat. Uh, we also have here a little descending line. So those are all descending, so we've got the natural notes. Now let's find some ascending examples uh, where we have the C sharp. Here. At the end, we've got in the bass the uh, B natural there and the C sharp. And then we get the D finally at the last measure here. Um, so you can see these are some examples of why the melodic minor exists. So in the repertoire workbook, I provided you with the D minor melodic scale in first position just to show you what the scale is and understand the concepts of it. And then we have the two octave version, which is going to help you learn and explore the upper regions of the piece where we start in the very beginning. Uh, this area of the fretboard is a little bit unknown to a lot of people, so I would recommend playing that two octave D melodic minor scale before you practice uh, this piece each time. I've also got in there uh, D minor melodic scale in thirds and tenths. Now, the reason is with this piece, with all the voices that are incorporated into it, you actually need a lot of finger independence. Like, look at this section, for example. You can see in the left hand, we're actually having to do a lot of finger independence. We've got certain notes being held down while others are moving. It's a little it's a little tricky there's no way around it that's why this is a level three intermediate piece so to develop those skills those that finger independence uh, scales and thirds are fantastic but even better I think are these scales and tenths and I've got a scale and tenths there in F major the relative major so go through those scales and get that finger independence going it's in the last two lines of the piece that we really start to come into some specific technical aspects. So we've got the slurs here, and here, and here, and we've also got the mordant and the trill. So I'm going to go through each of those now, and they are gone, they, they are covered in the repertoire workbook quite extensively. When we start using slurs in the piece at the end, they're used for these faster 16th note uh, little ideas. And these little ideas, this one finishes here, are drawn from the beginning motif, the idea of going four notes and landing on the fourth. So here we have, and at the beginning we had, but now instead of using eighth notes, we're using sixteenths. So it's like the opening structure just shortened a little bit. So. To create this kind of flow and also to help with the speed of these notes, I'm using slurs and it's often used in these kind of editions. So I've incorporated a lot of slur exercises to get these, these notes uh, clear and comfortable when you arrive to them because what you don't want is to have them sounding stressed or dip. you don't want them to sound difficult basically. So you can take those slurs and practice them systematically with the exercises I provided so when you get there they can sound comfortable and flowing because that's the feeling you want to get out of those slurs. The next little technical aspect is this upper mordant. So an upper mordant means that you have the original note, in this case you've got the E, and you play an F a note immediately above it and then come back down. So basically it's 
E, F, E played quite quickly. And it's an ornament, it's embellishing that original note of E. Now ornaments are actually quite virtuosic in a way. Trills and mordants, they require quite fast and accurate movements of the left hand. So I've incorporated a lot of uh, specific exercises uh, for the mordant where we we practice specific slows and also slows with an anchored finger because that's part of the difficulty here uh, is we've got that mordant with the anchored G sharp. So if you're going to practice it, make sure you practice it along with the G sharp. And you can come up with your own exercises as well. Lastly, we have the trill. Now, the trill here, in this piece, I definitely would be using a one string trill instead of a cross string trill. So if it was cross string, it sounds a little more like harpsichord music to me. So I would actually opt for the single string. You can make this trill as long or as short as you like. It's kind of up to your own sense of aesthetics. But I would recommend practicing this slower technique as with the modern, it is quite virtuosic. You have the option of using 2-1, 3-1, or a mixture of 2 and 3. And you'll find as the last exercise is on, uh, with those trill exercises, I've included one that has a rhythm. It starts eighth notes, triplets, then sixteenth notes. And what that helps you do is to structure that speed up towards the end of the trill. Instead of just being a little bit random with it, it's actually structured. It's kind of the same way I approach vibrato. Once you actually put it into the piece, I don't mean that you have to think about that specific rhythm, but it does help you train your fingers to be calm and relax into that speed up instead of speeding up too quickly, which is normally what happens. Lastly, I want to break this piece down for you in a sort of analysis. Now, analysis really doesn't mean that you have to break it down into Shankirian analysis or a harmonic analysis or a very finite structural analysis. Basically, it's any things you can find that make sense to you and that help you understand the piece, help you memorize the piece, help you play it more effectively. So I'm going to bring out a few points here and there's definitely a whole uh, annotated score in the repertoire workbook where I take you through the some of the ideas that I come up with. But I highly encourage you just to apply your own sense of analysis to any piece you're doing and don't think there's any kind of right or wrong. If it makes sense to you, then it's worthwhile. Oh, I just wanted to say, if you are going to go through this in the workbook, press pause now because I really would like you to do your own analysis first before you, we go through it together. So to start off with, we have this sense of phrasing here that goes basically short, short, long. This is, for all intents and purposes, the same as the sentential structure which I've talked about in the uh, Technique and Musicianship courses. So we've got short, short, long, and then it happens again. Short, short, long to the downbeat. Let me just play that for you. So it goes to the downbeat down here. So here's short, short, long. Then we start again. Short, short. Oops, I made a mistake, but that's long. So let me play those two uh, in sequence and you can hear that short, short, long effect. kind of sentential structure is really lovely and you'll hear it again and again and again in music for the Baroque, the classical romantic. It's a very common setup. Moving on, uh, we have a sequence. Now this sequence here is uh, follows the circle of fifths. And <laughs> the circle of fifths is I always like to think of uh, I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but what a sequence is, is a series of uh, repeated motives or ideas that are played at different pitches. So we have, and then lower down, and then higher up, and lower down, 
So it's this repeated idea, and it's a technique that he's used to break up the short, short, long phrasing that we've come across already. The end of this sequence passage breaks off into similar material and pauses here, again at the A major chord, and that, we're going to come back to that. Now, the final uh, two and a half measures here takes this short, short, long idea and applies it on a smaller scale. So we've got this short, and then I've already marked this in, short and then long. So we've got short, short, long. So you can really see that that's tied the whole section together. And if we take that all in uh, as a concept, let's zoom out a little bit, then we've got short, short, long is one section, there's your A, and then short, short, long again. Let's talk that, call that A1. Then the sequences, we'll call that B, and then we've got short, short, long again as a little ending section, but we'll call that C. So we've got four distinct sections, and I promise you in the repertoire workbook this is more clearly laid out. One thing of note is that every time these longer phrases end, like here or here, uh, where's the other one? Or here, measure three, they all end on A major chords. Uh, let me play them very quickly. A major. A major. Sequence. Major. Surprise, surprise. Now we get to the last phrase, the last longer phrase. Oops. <laughs> it's hard to talk and play at the same time. Then we have finally a sense of closure. It's not even really a D major chord because it's just D A D, just open fifths there. But we don't have that A major again. We finally get a D. So it's gone five, 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 one gives a real nice sense of closure to the piece. So I like to think about the piece in that kind of structure and it helps me understand the piece in terms of phrasing. It gives me breathing points and also just points of collection as we go along through the piece. Finally, uh, I've gone through the fingering of the piece uh, in the repertoire workbook. I've offered my own fingering, but I really encourage you to go through and do your own fingering first. Now that we've talked about all of these materials, you have at your disposal a lot of information that will dictate your choices. So, for example, uh, in the beginning here, we want to keep that, you know, you could easily play it here in, in, uh, on the fifth fret. But I think to make it more vocal and to keep it all on the same string is really desirable because it's like a vocal line. And also I managed to keep in my fingering, oops, that lower line also on the same string. While technically it might be a little easier to play it in first position, it's actually a little harder to maintain that line, that phrasing that we want to bring out. So whatever choices you make with the fingering, let that fingering be in service of the music, even if it's a little technically more difficult than playing it in first position or whatever is most convenient technically. So aim for the musical goal. So I hope you have enjoyed this walkthrough of the piece of repertoire. If you'd like to get the repertoire workbook, it's there waiting for you at classicalguitarcorner.com. And uh, there are many, many more walkthroughs like this, some even much more detailed on bigger pieces like Barrios Waltzes, um, available in the membership at classicalguitarcorner.com. All of the repertoire work workbooks and the practice technique, uh, practice schedules, no, practice technical routines <laughs> in the scale book. They're all available in the annual membership. All the library is available to annual members. So you're welcome to become an annual member at Classical Guitar Corner as well. Have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.